At the end of our lives, we're all going to face death. At that time, we will either face God or we will face nothingness. The fact that we're all going to die is not some subjective personal preference, but rather an objective truth. Therefore, it should concern us ahead of time to know which one is true. Either we will face God or we will face nothingness. I want to welcome you to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle. And we're about to embark on a five-part series that talks about the evidence for the existence of God. Now, as we get started, I'd like to begin with two of the main evidences people use against coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the first one is the argument about morality, absolutes. And the argument goes like this. If you call God good and all-powerful, then why does he allow for evil and suffering to exist? That is one of the main arguments people use for accepting Jesus Christ. And the second argument is, show me any evidence that God really does exist. For example, who made God? Where did God come from? You Christians are always invoking some magical entity to explain all your evidence. Or, I can't believe in something I can't see. These are two of the main reasons people deny the existence of God or deny coming to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Absolute morality and does God exist? Well, I'd like to give us three cautions. As Christians, we have three cautions here. We do not need to prove that God exists. That is a fact. That is part of our biblical worldview as Christians, the fact of God. Secondly, as Christians, we should not require evidence for a belief in a creator God. His word should be our authority in all matters. And third, it is not that we should not use evidence. Sometimes evidence can be very useful in helping non-believers understand. The point is, we should not use evidence in such a matter that it puts God on trial. However, in all cases, in all cases, we should always be ready with an answer or defense. That comes right out of 1 Peter 3.15 where it commands us as Christians to have a ready defense for the hope that's within us. We also see this in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 where we're told to bring down all strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So we need to tell non-believers about the existence of God. Now in this five-part series, we will examine five different evidences for the existence of God. And these will be, number one, the cosmological evidence. Number two, evidence from design. Number three, evidence from the existence of morality or absolutes, meaning what's the difference between right and wrong. Number four, evidence from the existence of non-material entities. And number five, the reality of God's Word. Now, as we get started, a good question to ask a non-believer might go like this. Is it impossible for the God of the Bible to exist? Well, they have two responses, yes and no. If they answer yes to that, then we can ask them, how do you know that is impossible? Do you know everything? But if they answer no, then there is a possibility in their worldview that God could exist. Now, in this first session, dealing with the evidence for the existence of God, we're going to cover cosmology, or the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Now, as Christians, we will start with our worldview. We will begin with this premise. God is a self-existing, eternal being. He has no beginning and no end. We maintain this assertion because it agrees with all reality. It is both a logical and a scientific explanation. It agrees with the fact that the universe does exist. It agrees that we have mass and energy. It agrees with our laws of science, our laws of logic and morality and all truth. So our biblical worldview starts this way. God does exist and His Word is true. That is the basic premise or presupposition all Christians should have. Without this as our starting point, we really have no argument against the non-believer because this argument that God does exist and His Word is true is the foundation for all that we believe. It is the very foundation for the truth of His Word, the Bible. 
So let's begin with the cosmological argument, and it starts this way. How did the universe begin? What a question that is. How did the universe begin? Now, we're not talking about the Big Bang, because a lot of non-believers will start with the Big Bang, but we can't start there. Because what we're talking about is, where did the matter come from to create the Big Bang? Because you cannot have a Big Bang if there's not something there to go bang to start it all with. Now, there are only three possibilities to answer this question. Where did the matter come from to create this universe? Possibility number one, the universe created itself. That would indicate the universe had a beginning. Possibility number two, the universe has always existed. That would indicate there was no beginning. And the third possibility is there had to be a creator, which means there was a beginning. So those are the only three options we have. And we'll start with option one here. The universe created itself. Now in this scenario, our starting point is nothing. No space, no time, matter, energy. Now, we will ask this question. What was the cause that brought it into existence? In order for something to create itself, it would have to have the power and energy to call itself into existence. But since nothing exists, there can be no source of energy for a first cause. In addition, since nothing exists, there's no space to call herself into existence. See, that's just good logic and science. To create yourself, you have to have the power to create yourself. But if you don't exist, you have no power or energy. And for this universe to create itself, if there's nothing there, there's no space either. So where do you pop yourself into existence? Also, there is the first law of thermodynamics we must consider which states this. It is called the law of conservation of energy. And it states that the total amount of energy of an isolated system is constant. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but cannot be created or destroyed. So when we look at all of this, no space to call, call yourself into existence, no energy to cause you to come into existence, and then the first law of thermodynamics both science and logic seem to refute this option that the universe created itself. Now, John Warwick Montgomery, a PhD in theology and also a doctorate of law, makes this statement. Nothing in this world is able to explain its own existence. Thus, there must be a God in order to explain the world in which we find ourselves. Now, Steve Coomer, PhD in philosophy, in his book, Christianity for Skeptics makes this statement. If God is the cause of the universe, then he must be beyond and greater than the physical dimension. Therefore, we may discover the effects or evidence of God in the universe, but not necessarily observe the essence of God within the universe, for the profound reason that he transcends space, time, and matter. Now let's turn to option number two. The universe has always existed. Three things we need to consider about that statement. Number one, if the universe has always existed, meaning no beginning, then it would be an infinite number of years old. Secondly, we need to consider now the second law of thermodynamics. And third, we need to consider the law of cause and effect. Now let's go to part one here. What does it mean to be an infinite number of years old? Well, that would mean time without end, Latin for boundless. In mathematics, it means this, existing beyond or being greater than any arbitrary number. In other words, older than a trillion years. So that's what it means to be an infinite number of years old. Now, two, we need to consider the second law of thermodynamics. Now, to help us understand the second law of thermodynamics, I'd like to start with a definition and then give an illustration. The basic definition of the second law of thermodynamics goes like this. Energy goes from a state of usable energy to a state of less usable energy for doing work in an isolated system. In other words, we're losing our available energy for doing work. Now, there are a couple of correlations to this, and the correlations are order goes to a state of disorder. Not always, that's why it's only a correlation. And also, we're going from a state of complexity to a state of less complexity. But the definition deals with something called heat energy. That's what thermal means, 
heat, energy. So the second law of thermodynamics. Let's go to an illustration here. If someone was to give you a brand new car, and they said everything for the lifetime of this car is paid for. If anything goes wrong, it's fixed for free. Now that's a pretty good idea, and we would like that kind of uh, deal there, wouldn't we? But there's one little piece in the small print we must read, and that is, all we ever get is one tank of gas, no refills. Well, that presents a problem. What happens after we've driven that car about 300 miles? We've used up all the gasoline, all the energy that can be used to propel that car. This is an illustration of the second law. That energy, the gasoline, has all been used up and can no longer be used to propel that car. Our second illustration is stars. What do stars do? Well, they burn their lighter elements into heavier elements. For example, they burn their hydrogen into helium, into carbon, into oxygen, and maybe eventually into iron. And once they've burned up all their energy, they begin to gravitation and collapse inward and will explode in what we call a great big supernova. And that's another illustration of the second law. They burned up all their energy and can no longer give us light the way they do. So the second law basically states that the quantity of available energy for doing work is decreasing, not increasing. It is decreasing, getting less and less. Therefore, if we go backwards in time, there was more available energy in this universe. This means over time, the stars are losing their energy, not getting new energy. Therefore, after maybe a trillion years, all the stars in this universe would have burned up all their energy and there should be no stars left. That's a good illustration of what would happen if this universe had no beginning. It was infinite. All the stars would be gone. So what do the non-believers do about this? Well, they give us a challenge. The challenge is new stars are forming all the time. Well, is this actually true? Well, I do read that in the textbooks, but the question is, has anybody ever observed this? And does that statement, new stars are forming all the time, really agree with science? Well, what we have found out, and what we know, based on observable and repeatable evidence, folks, is that stars really will not form by naturalistic processes. Well, how is it done, according to the evolutionists? Well, we get these gas and dust clouds that rotate around, round and around in outer space. They just go ra rotating around and around. As they rotate around and around, they begin to gravitationally collapse inward due to the rotation, and get so dense they form a new star. But folks, that does not agree with science. It might agree with evolution possibilities or evolution philosophy, but it does not agree with real science. Let me read you some quotes from scientists. Dr. Jason Lyle, who has his PhD in astrophysics, makes this statement. Star formation is problematic at best. Gas is very resistant to being compressed. However, in a typical nebula, the gas pressure far exceeds the minuscule force of gravity. In other words, what he's saying here is what we actually observe and we can test. As that cloud rotates around and around, it will begin to collapse inward due to the gravity. But as it does so, it generates heat pressure, which is stronger than the gravity and always causes that cloud to expand outward. That, folks, is real science. Now, let me read you some more quotes from other scientists. Dr. Walter Brown has his PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT, makes this statement. Astronomers recognize that the densest gas clouds seen in the universe today could not form stars by any known means, including gravitational collapse, unless that gas was thousands, once thousands of times more compact. According to the Big Bang Theory, stars began to form by gravitational collapse of dust and gas clouds 500 million years after the Big Bang's sudden inflation. Martin Harwood, astronomer, author, and former director of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., points out that this were true, the vast energy angular momentum and magnetic fields generated by each collapse would be clearly visible, but they are not. Well, let's turn to Scientific American, not a Christian journal, and we read this. 
once a protostar reaches a threshold of about 20 solar masses, the pressure exerted by this radiation should overpower gravity and prevent it from growing any bigger. In addition to the radiation pressure, the winds that so massive a star generates disperse its natal cloud, further limiting its growth as well as interfering with the formation of nearby stars. And let's continue. John Hartnett, PhD in physics, makes this statement. Without something else, the outward pressure due to kinetic energy of the gas molecules in the cloud is so much greater than the inward pressure due to the mutual gravitational attraction of the cloud that the resulting net outward pressure would cause the gas cloud to disperse rather than collapse. And finally, from Science Journal, we read this. We don't understand how a single star forms Yet we want to understand how 10 billion stars form? Folks, the only thing we can conclude here is the universe cannot be infinite number of years old. It had to have a beginning or it would simply be out of energy. Now, we've looked at the idea of infinity. We've looked at the second law of thermodynamics. Now let's look at the law of cause and effect. Now, the law of cause and effect teaches this. Everything that has a beginning has a cause. Now, notice that. Everything that has a beginning must have a cause. Also, it teaches every material effect must have an adequate cause that existed before the effect. Also, every single effect first had a cause that can be traced to a previous effect from another cause and eventually back to a first cause. In other words, <clears throat> The universe, therefore, requires a cause more powerful than itself. Well, we do have some scientists out there that try and deny cause and effect, even though it is a well-established law of science. Some phys physicists assert that quantum mechanics violates this law of cause and effect, and the principle can produce something from nothing. That's what they're telling us. I've seen this on national TV. We get these physicists out there saying, oh, nothing can create something. It's happening all the time. <clears throat> For example, Dr. Paul Davies, a physicist, writes, space-time could appear out of nothingness as a result of a quantum transition. Particles can appear out of nothing without specific causation. Yet the world of quantum mechanics routinely produces something out of nothing. Well, what are we to say about that? Well, theories that the universe is a quantum fluctuation producing something out of nothing presupposes there was something there to fluctuate. See, they don't talk about that. However, you see, their quantum vacuum is a lot of matter, antimatter potential, not nothing. If the universe had no cause, then it can't have any properties to explain its extraordinary ability to call itself into existence by itself because it, would have, because it wouldn't have any properties until it actually came into existence. Therefore, options one and two, option one being the universe created itself, and option two, the universe has always existed, cannot be true unless we simply do not want to believe in science and logic. The universe simply could not call itself into existence, and the universe could not have existed for infinity. But what about God? What about God here? Well, see, the Bible teaches God is the creator of all things. He is the creator of space, time, and matter. And we see that in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, he is not bound by the laws of science that govern material things. And he does not need a first cause. He has always existed and he is not material. Therefore, that does not violate any known laws of science that God is the creator of all things. So as we bring this to a conclusion, C.S. Evans, Ph.D. in philosophy, makes this statement. Belief in God is genuinely coherent with all we know about ourselves and our universe. It contradicts no known facts and it makes sense of many things that would otherwise be inexplicable. Now, let's turn to the Bible. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 teach us this. 
For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist. He is indeed the creator of all things. He created space, time, and matter, and he transcends this creation. He is not bound by it. And then let's turn to a scene in heaven. The book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And we read, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. See, all of creation, including the host of heaven, cry out for a creator God whom we will be all be held accountable to. Thank you, and God bless you. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's Word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Thank you.